And now we come to the man at the top of the NHS in England, the Chief Executive, Sir Simon Stevens. Sir Simon, welcome. And rather unusually, before we start this interview, I'm going to explain that we're going to do it in sort of three parts, if we may. Okay. What went well for the NHS at the beginning, what didn't go so well for the NHS, and then the future of the NHS. So very straightforward. So can I start? Was there a point at which you thought the NHS was going to be overwhelmed? In March we were looking at what was happening in northern Italy. Mm -hmm. We were being advised by the epidemiologists and the public health experts that we could see as many as two million people requiring hospital care. Two million. Of whom perhaps a third might require intensive care. And so, yes, there was considerable concern. So if you think about the actions that then had to be taken to uh, free up uh, hospital capacity uh, so that, in fact, in a few short weeks we were able to successfully look after 100,000 coronavirus patients who needed specialist emergency care. That was something that was not inevitable, even though when we now look back with the benefit of hindsight, we take it for granted that the NHS was there for everybody who needed it. And you built the Nightingale hospitals, of course, huge hospitals, um, and yet very, very few people actually ever were treated in the Nightingale hospitals. Looking back, was that a waste of resources? It's no surprise that the staff of the NHS uh, behaved amazingly, but uh, perhaps uh, the critics of the NHS may have been surprised at just how agile and flexible and quick the NHS response was. If you think back to the scenes in Wuhan in China where they built their field hospital, Everybody said, that's something, how come the Chinese can do it? We could we never do it here. It. Actually, we did it in 10 days and we did it seven times over. Not just that, but we also, of course, doubled critical care capacity in our major hospitals. We saw 18,000 staff coming back to uh, help out. We were the first country in the world to run randomised clinical trials to produce treatments that actually work for coronavirus. So the NHS response has been very substantial and has, I think, confounded expectations. And what's going to happen to the Nightingale hospitals going forward? Are they waiting for another wave or are they going to be used for some other purpose or simply dismantled? We're going to use them in two ways. First of all, as we're already now doing in Harrogate and Exeter, we want Nightingale-type diagnostic care to ensure that people are able to get uh, tests and checkups. But we also are going to need to sustain a significant part of that Nightingale capacity going into this winter, given the concerns about the possibility of a resurgence in coronavirus. Now, everybody remembers looking back at this period, standing outside and clapping for the NHS. There's more clapping going on today. But a lot of NHS staff, want, what they really want is a pay, a pay increase. And they've written a letter saying that they would like a substantial, meaningful pay increase by the end of this year. Do you stand with them? Well, you'd expect me as the uh, head of the NHS to back uh, staff across the health service. Yes. Of course, we want to see NHS staff properly rewarded. Uh, those will be decisions that uh, government will have to take uh, later in the year. But I think there's no doubt that not just in the NHS, but also in social care, the whole success of the service relies on our frontline staff. Now, all of that costs money. Have you asked the Chancellor for 10 billion extra for this year? What I've done with my colleagues is ask that there be necessary funding to deal with the extra costs of coronavirus. That's the commitment that the Chancellor gave back in March, and I have to tell you, he has delivered on it. Uh, he has indeed provided the additional funding that we have needed through this coronavirus pandemic. So you're not asking for extra money and that's being refused because he told me, uh, sitting where you're sitting, that he was going to give the NHS whatever it needed this year, and he is living up to that. He has it? been doing that, absolutely, and looking out over the balance of the year, obviously there are judgments to be made about how we sustain the extra beds we think we're going to need. We're likely to have a big flu vaccination campaign this winter. There are very significant extra costs from personal protective equipment and uh, other parts of the service. So how much extra do you think you need this year? Well, that is a dialogue that we are having, but all the signs are that uh, we will continue to get the support that we need. Let's look at some of the things that went wrong over this process, because wh however you look at the figures, when you look at excess deaths or average death tolls and so forth, Britain is very, very nearly at the worst performing country, certainly in the G7 and actually all around the world. I think we're second worst when it comes to excess deaths and so forth. So something went wrong. Did it go wrong inside the NHS? The NHS was able to provide care for every coronavirus patient who needed it. So I think the fundamental 
point is that we ended up with a higher number of coronavirus infections across the country as a whole compared with some others. And that gets you into the question as to whether or not more community transmission was occurring in February and March uh, than was apparent at the time before the measures that the public then took uh, kicked in. And so that, in a sense, is outside the NHS, that bit of the story. When it comes to the NHS... I, mean, I think just on that, Andrew, I mean, we're still learning a great deal about the way in which coronavirus spreads. Of course. I mean, three weeks ago, we found out as a result of a... Very interesting piece of uh, research looking at the genomics, if you like, the family tree of coronavirus, that actually rather a small amount of the spread was from China, as had been first thought, and a much more significant uh, proportion of the coronavirus infection that arrived here came from Italy and Spain mm. and France. So we, I think, are still a long way off knowing the full answer to that question. So it, we didn't know that at the time, but it, had we known that at the time, presumably closing the borders earlier would have spared us quite a lot of deaths. Well, look, I think uh, the benefit of hindsight uh, is a wonderful thing. Um, I don't think that's fundamentally uh, the question going forward. The question going forward is how do we ensure that we mm. keep very close tabs on uh, any local spikes that might arise? Uh, we've seen in other countries right now, whether it's in you know, Melbourne, Australia, or whether it's in uh, Catalonia in Spain, uh, whether it's North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany, uh, local lockdowns required. So we're going to have to be vigilant because unfortunately coronavirus is going to be with us for months if not years to come. So if we look at those people with coronavirus who are then admitted to British hospitals, yep. do we have any idea in terms of the survival rate how well British hospitals uh, performed compared to hospitals in other countries, America or France or Italy or Germany or anywhere else? I think there's no reason to think that uh, the quality of care, the response here was not as good as it would have been anywhere. You obviously have to adjust for some of the risk factors that uh, different patients have. We know, for example, that obesity doubles your chance of dying from coronavirus. And unfortunately, uh, we're, quite we are a all carrying country. too many pounds uh, mm. as, a, as a country. So there is a strong case for using the experience of coronavirus to tackle some of these long-standing, mm. broader health problems and get serious about prevention, including, frankly, obesity. Let's turn to PPE, personal protective equipment. In the early weeks of this, this uh, crisis, we had doctors on the programme week after week after week expressing fear and, frankly, anger about the lack of PPE. Do you take some responsibility for that? Well, I think it's undoubtedly the case that there was a perfect storm in respect of uh, PPE, not just in this country but across Europe. We had a combination of a huge increase in the need for it at exactly the same time as the uh, Chinese uh, economy was in uh, lockdown and a very significant dependence, not just here, but across Europe on Chinese supply. So put those two things together, it clearly created um, a very uh, difficult situation. But you're the man at the top and some of your staff were not properly protected. We've got very, very heart-wrenching comments from the um, nurses saying that they were crying at work, crying before work, crying after work. We've got doctors talking about being used like cannon fodder. There's real anger about this issue. And there has been, had been discussions inside the government about stockpiling PPE that hadn't happened. So again, as the guy at the top, do you take responsibility? Well, I would say that I think the government actually has pulled out all the stops to procure the PPE uh, that we need at the same time as beginning to build a domestic PPE industry. The fact is that there has been no occasion when nationally we have stocked out of the PPE that's required and the Department of Health and the Cabinet Office have something called the National uh, Disruption Response Line that has been able to get emergency supplies of PPE the same day to every hospital as needed it. That is not to say that there haven't been moments when uh, it has been a close run thing. Very close run thing, and you know some of the comments that have been said about people wearing cagoules, etc., cagoule like clothes, and so on. Um, one of the ways that you've dealt with PPE, surely, is that you took stocks that were going to go to care homes, because the situation in care homes has been even worse than inside the anywhere in the NHS. Well, the Department the of NHS Health were, have been asked about that, including uh, last week in Parliament, and were clear that that is not what had happened. Well, the National Care Association say, we were told by one of our suppliers they were not able to send us PPE as they had to prioritise the NHS. And there's well, many the, such the comments. Depart the Department of Health and Social Care have said in, uh, very clearly that they at no point had taken uh, PPE away from social care. 
That's not to say that given that we've gone from a situation where normally the PPE supply chain uh, that they operate would supply 228 hospitals and has gone to a situation where they have to supply 58,000 uh, different outlets. Generally, social care, care homes buy their own PPE from wholesalers. As I said, there clearly was this perfect storm of a combination of disrupted Chinese supply, on which, by the way, we still have a very great reliance, alongside a huge spike in demand for PPE worldwide. Well, let's talk about care homes, if we may, more yep. generally. 15,600 people at least have died of COVID-19 in English care homes. Um, something serious went wrong in that situation. And a lot of people point to that moment when uh, patients were transferred from NHS hospitals into care homes without being tested first. You wrote a letter on the 17th of March to the NHS trusts instructing them to free up the maximum possible inpatient and critical care capacity by, quotes, urgently discharging all hospital inpatients who are medically fit to leave. Now, hindsight, as we've agreed, is a very, very easy thing. And there's a very, very hard decisions you had to take at that point. But looking back, that was a mistake, wasn't it? Hospitals were absolutely right to ensure that they had the ability to look after the huge wave of coronavirus patients that were headed that their way. If you look uh, even at a great, uh, a very poignant BBC Two programme this past mm. week on Monday night, looking at the situation in northern Italy, there where that hadn't happened, doctors were having to play God, choose who would live and who would die from mm. coronavirus. So hospitals did the right thing in ensuring they were able to look after um, all the coronavirus mm. patients that needed it. But I think there are some other uh, aspects to this that just need to be drawn out. The sad truth is that coronavirus disproportionately affects the very elderly. Mm. Uh, you're 12 times more likely to be mm. a victim if you're over 80 than if you're uh, younger. And we've seen in all European countries that around two-fifths of the coronavirus deaths have been in mm. care homes. So actually what happened is that hospitals reduced the number of patients that were discharged to uh, care homes. Only about 3% of mm. the uh, discharges were to care homes. And they were all because the clinicians felt that that was the medically appropriate thing to do. And we're talking yet about 25,000 people there or thereabouts going from hospitals into care homes during the relevant period. And the real question is why they weren't tested first. Well, hospitals have followed rigorously the recommendations, the instructions that they've been given by the uh, public health experts. On the 11th of March, uh, PHE, Public Health England, set the priorities for testing based on the limited amount of testing capacity that they had available at the time. So it's a capacity they, question, really. Well, th they understandably prioritised patients who were in intensive care or requiring emergency uh, medical uh, support. And PHE have uh, explained that the reason that uh, in part they had to do that was because there were only several thousand tests available to them at the time. So we simply didn't have enough tests to protect care homes from people possibly with COVID-19 being moved into them out of hospitals. And well, that I, would, I would point out, Andrew, we actually introduced mandatory testing for patients moving into care homes before Germany, before Scotland yeah, and England. But, but still so after the main, this. Yeah, but, so I think we've got to be, if we want to learn the lessons in order that we can mm. protect care homes appropriately, then we've actually got to understand what actually might be the main sources of uh, infection. And studies by Public Health England, another report out this week, Vivaldi, shows that part of the issue, of course, is the transmission from the community into care homes. Care homes, sadly, that have more temporary staff, where staff are moving between homes, have between a 50 and 100% increased risk of infection. So yeah. the best care homes were able to go into lockdown. Local authorities were able to set up um, isolation or quarantining facilities. We need that in place everywhere across the care home sector going into this winter. Now, the staffing side is clearly part of this story. But nonetheless, of those 25,000 sent into care homes, have you any idea how many of them had COVID-19? Well, hospitals themselves and NHS providers have said in terms that they did not knowingly discharge patients with COVID to care homes. And uh, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock has said that at this stage, nobody really knew about asymptomatic transmission. And yet I had thought that SAGE and other bodies had been talking about asymptomatic transmission transmission, not in a very big way, but that it was possible as early as January. 
Well, I think the um, data on that has clearly um, beca it become apparent that that is a much bigger uh, problem and is frankly the, the one of the reasons why this particular coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, has turned out to be uh, such a worldwide problem. It is the extent of uh, pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission. Uh, when politicians are asked about this episode, they've, they always use the word, it was based on clinical advice, which, as I said to Matt Hancock, it does sound to some people as if the politicians are trying to blame the doctors for what happened. Well, I think the, the, the uh, point to go forward on here is that what this has clearly done is shine a very harsh spotlight on what is happening in uh, the resilience and support available in social care. And yeah. if any good is to come from this, in my opinion, we must use this as a moment to resolve once and for all to actually properly resource and reform the way in which social care works in this country. Today is the 72nd anniversary of the NHS. It's also the 72nd anniversary of the National Assistance Act, which kicked off uh, social care provision. Um, the reality, however, is that uh, after at least two decades of talking about it, we do not have a fair and properly resourced uh, adult social care system with a proper set of workforce supports. If you've got a situation where a quarter of your social care staff are on zero hours contracts, where you've got uh, one third churn in uh, employment uh, each year, that is not the preconditions for being able to provide high quality care for our older people. And so I think at this moment, if nothing else, uh, as we look back at uh, Beveridge and think about the five giants, uh, if Beveridge were writing his report today, he would talk about a sixth, which is uh, healthy ageing, uh, dignity in old age. And I would hope that by the time we are uh, sitting down uh, this time next year, on the 73rd birthday of the NHS, we have actually, as a country, been able to decisively answer the question, how are we going to fund and provide high quality social care for my parents' generation? We've been talking about this subject for a long time. I've had previous conversations with you about this. I ask politicians about it all the time, and you're right. They talk and they talk and they talk, and so far nothing has happened, partly because it's a very expensive and politically controversial thing to do. But you, th you believe that this must be fixed within a year? I do, because if you take back the, uh, the history uh, coming out of the Second World War, the country at that point was um, austerity. We had rationing of uh, bread and potatoes. Uh, there was great uncertainty uh, about uh, what our post-war reconstruction would look like. The founders of the NHS did not use that as a moment to hesitate. They said, let one of the legacies of the war be the creation of the NHS. That's the same legacy we need for long-term care support in social care coming out of coronavirus. Let me ask you about a report into the experience of black and Asian people as NHS staff and as NHS yep. patients. Public Health England reported into the impact of COVID-19 on BAME communities, and they said this. They said, historic racism and pure, poorer experiences of health care or at work may mean that individuals in BAME groups are less likely to seek care when needed or as NHS staff are less likely to speak up when they've got concerns about PPE or risk. Do you accept that report? And if so, what are you doing about it? Yes, I think the NHS, as the largest employer of black, Asian and minority ethnic people in this country, has a special responsibility. And I said that I think we are both part of the problem and part of the solution. Uh, the reality is that we rely heavily on uh, the support of the one in five uh, NHS staff from uh, black, Asian, minority ethnic uh, backgrounds. And so we have to listen very carefully to those challenges. So we're talking now about the future. Are you preparing at the moment for a second wave of COVID-19 this winter? Yes, it is um, entirely possible that there will be, particularly if it is coexistent with flu. And the risk is that many of the symptoms are um, uh, interchangeable. And so one of the things that we clearly need is a uh, very rigorous uh, NHS testing and tracing uh, service available. Uh, the ability to give early warnings to hospitals where there are those uh, local increases. And I think we're going to need uh, the biggest ever uh, flu immunisation season we've ever had.
We don't know yet whether there will be a COVID vaccine available in time for winter. Mm -hmm. There are more than 20 uh, research groups that are uh, doing that right now. What's your best guess about that as somebody overseeing all of this? Well, um, a number of the leading researchers suggest that uh, there is a possibility that sometime between September and December such a vaccine might become available. But there's still quite considerable uncertainty as to how you would administer it. Will it be two doses or one? Uh, do you have to take it separately from the flu jab? How long does the uh, immunity last? But clearly that would be a major gain were we able to get it. Well, fingers crossed. All this has to be achieved with staff who are already absolutely exhausted, on their knees with exhaustion, going ahead. This is going to have a big effect on other kinds of NHS treatment, whether it's cancer or hip replacements, knee replacements and so forth. How big is the NHS backlog going to be for the rest of this year? Throughout the uh, coronavirus uh, peak, where we've had to look after more than 100,000 coronavirus patients in hospital, we have uh, been able to sustain many of those other urgent treatment services and indeed have fast forwarded some of the uh, innovations that we'd want to see. So rollout of uh, more precise forms of radiotherapy, uh, new cancer drugs that require fewer visits to hospital, um, new cystic fibrosis drugs, which we just were able to approve uh, this past week, mm. uh, a move away from a reliance on having to go to the GP surgery or the outpatient appointment uh, and instead get uh, support or advice over the phone or online as an additional option. So all of that uh, has been sustained, in fact, fast forwarded. Um, but there's no doubt about it that during coronavirus, during lockdown, a lot of people stayed away from having their um, signs or symptoms uh, checked up. We therefore want to uh, appeal to people, if you think you've got a concern, particularly a cancer, please come forward, get it checked out. And I that, in turn, will then uh, answer your question, Andrew, as to how, how many, much extra... How many? Sure. Uh, how are, many? You, are you worried that you're going to see lots of people coming into hospitals with more advanced cancers than would have been the case before the COVID-19 pandemic? Most cancers are relatively slow growing and therefore if it's a matter of weeks or a couple of months uh, then that um, as long as those services are able to recover uh, people come forward uh, we should be able to respond but what we really need to ensure is that people don't hold back now. Uh, there are some can things we would like people to hold back for. Um, you know we've benefited greatly from uh, many fewer A&E attendances yes. because people have been out uh, boozing. Uh, fewer road traffic accidents uh, caused by uh, alcohol. Yes. Um, you know, the, um, uh, pleasingly, we did not see last night um, the kind of scenes that uh, people feared might be. Expected, it it yes. was the foolish few, but the sensible majority, I think, is the story across the country, and long may that continue. I think the NHS Federation have talked about uh, 10 million strong waiting list by the end of the year. And I'm not going to ask you to say yes or no to that, but that seems to be the area that we're talking about. Can I ask in specific terms about people who've had COVID-19, who have clearly got long-term yeah. uh, health problems that we didn't expect before? Can you tell us a bit about that and how much of a strain that's going to put on the NHS? Well, we're having to build a new service, a new COVID rehabilitation service for people who have survived. Uh, more than 70,000 people have uh, come through successfully their hospital treatment but it is apparent that there can be significant uh, scarring on the lungs that shows up under CT scans. Uh, there can be uh, other complications. So the new uh, COVID recovery service, which we're establishing, actually designed uh, in Leicester from a, a group there, will give people a face-to-face -face, uh, checkup, tailor make a package, and then 12 weeks worth of uh, online and uh, digital yes. video support with physios and nurses and others. Uh, but this is going to be a legacy that will be with us for years to come. This is not something that has just been resolved in four very intense short months. And meanwhile, we have to have hospitals, in particular A&E departments, which are going to be differently configured as a result of the pandemic. There's going to have to be lots of quarantining positions and so forth. People talk about negative pressure rooms, which avoid um, uh, COVID or any other virus escaping from a room into another room and so on. How much rebuilding is there going to have to be of NHS facilities as a result of what we've learned in the pandemic? We are going to have to redesign uh, facilities and uh, ways in which people get looked after because you can't, we, we need to maintain social distancing uh, in A&Es, uh, but you can't therefore go back to the old model that we had. And that's why 
the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, the A&E consultants are quite right to say that we've got to find new ways in which uh, people with uh, more minor conditions can get looked after. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, we saw during the pandemic that uh, by a ratio of about 14 to 1 of the A&E yes. attendances that didn't turn up, they were for more minor conditions that could be looked after in other ways. We're almost out of time, but if we get that vaccine everyone's waiting for, will it be the NHS that delivers it? Yes, my expectation is that alongside the flu vaccine, we will need to... And what do you uh, need to do that? In order to do that, we're going to need to uh, train up uh, tens of thousands of uh, right. NHS staff to deliver uh, those vaccines. Uh, big but job ahead. A big job ahead. But, right. Andrew, I would just end by saying, if I could, 72nd anniversary, the country, of course, rightly thanking my colleagues on the front line of the NHS. We too, however, want to use this to thank other workers across the country who have helped ensure the NHS itself was able to be there when people needed us. Sir Simon Stevens, thanks very much indeed for that. that